but let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your, your goodness to us. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that even in moments when what you have called us to do is challenging, Lord, we trust you in the fact that we know who you are. You're a good, good father. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that today that you would speak to us. Lord, help us to be able to look past the messenger today and hear the message of our Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, there are some moments when Jesus made some really, really hard statements in Scripture. Now, it, Jesus made many challenging statements. But there are certain moments in Scripture that I look at um, and I, could, I, I say this, <clears throat> there are many Christians that cannot handle what Jesus just said. Now, I'm going to explain why, and I'm going to show you one of those today. But there are many uh, scriptures, not many of them, but there's a few moments, a few glimpses where Jesus makes a statement, and you're just like, wow, that, that, that's pretty heavy right there. And it takes a level of maturity and a level of big picture to really be able to handle those words because you know there were certain moments in time and i'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of set all of this up for you there are certain moments when jesus had these massive crowds following him and i've referenced john chapter 6 a lot when i'm setting something up because there were all these people that were following jesus and and there were crowds i mean thousands of people in some of these moments when Jesus is teaching. And John chapter 6 is a great example of that. And Jesus said some things, and they were there because of all the miracles and all the excitement. They were there for all the benefits that came from their relationship with Jesus. And then he would say something to them that required something back from them. And sometimes very challenging for them, very sacrificial for them. And in John chapter 6, a great example of what we see all the time with Christians is he asked them to come another step towards him and they walked away and stopped following him. Because they weren't ready, they weren't really all in. Okay? Now, you say, well, pastor, how can you say that? Well, uh, because I see it. I, I, I'm a pastor, I deal with people all the time. And so, I've actually wrestled over time, even recently, and I have notes in my phone about a series that I've considered doing called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. Now, the reason why I have not done it is because... These were challenges that seemed to, the hard sayings that, that challenged people to an, another level. And I'm, I'm afraid that if I do a few weeks of them, everybody will look like they've been in a boxing match beat up the whole time, you know? <laughs> because it, it's very, very hard stuff. And yet, it's crucial to go to certain levels in our faith to understand these things. So today, we're going to see one of those statements. Uh, and yet, it's a, a piece that culturally... I need to explain, but you need to understand something. I'm not going to soften it. This is, there, there are some things that I believe that Jesus intended to be said the way that they were said and allow us to just, man, I need some time to process that one. I need some time to process it. But what I need to do is bring you into the cultural understanding so that you can understand the full truth and the power of what Jesus said. And so here we're looking at this passage of Scripture here in Luke chapter 9, and we're going to begin reading in verse 57. Luke has some very long chapters, but in 57. Now, I'm not going to read very much, but Jesus said some stuff, some pretty heavy stuff right here. 57, he said, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, here we see a statement that is made many times through the ages. As a pastor, I see people make this statement, and not only during the time when Jesus was walking this earth, that time span, but also in the ages since. Um, there are many things that have motivated many people to, uh, to make this kind of statement. If you go look through Scripture, there are times when Jesus was calling people to follow him, and then there were times when people approached Jesus and said, I will follow you. And, and so there's this, there's this, it goes both ways, and they recognize, people follow him, and I used the example in John chapter 6 a moment ago, that they recognize uh, and therefore desire to be connected to something so amazing, the miracles, the supernatural, all of the benefits, all of the blessings. Then there's also people who come to understand the exclusive nature of the gospel. Um, you know, just so people know in here, I'm going to say something unapologetically. 
is that all roads do not lead to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Um, that, that, that isn't, that, there's one way to heaven, only one way to heaven. It is exclusive. And there are probably many, many more possible reasons why people will approach Jesus. And while I am careful never to take lightly someone's offer to follow Jesus, there is always a reality of with Jesus and in any way that, that let's wait and see how serious they are with their faith. Because all too often, people will speak quickly like this person who made this commitment to Jesus about following him, quote unquote, anywhere, without first thinking about what or where anywhere really means. And that is mostly based off of a person's view of the benefits only Rather than like Jesus said in another passage here in Luke, he said, no one builds a tower without first sitting down and counting the cost if they can finish the job. There were other times when Jesus said statements, he said uh, to them, take up your cross and follow me daily. Now, you need to understand that. They had a different understanding of the cross than we have. We know the benefits of the cross. And back then, they didn't know any benefits of the cross. Jesus had not yet been on the cross and rose from the dead and all that. So we see the cross as something to celebrate. There was no celebration to them. When Jesus made that statement, said, take up your cross and follow me. And it's kind of like Peter, who told Jesus on the night when Jesus was betrayed and arrested. He said, Jesus, even if all of these others uh, betray me, I will follow you to the end. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, I always try to get the expressions in, in certain situations. And I'm sure Jesus looked down the table at Peter, maybe grinned, maybe had a look on his face, maybe he teared up even. And he turned to Peter and he said, this night you will deny me three times. Because Jesus knew what Peter did not know, the cost that Peter would have to pay to follow Jesus. Let me tell you something sacrifice is a part of life as a christian whether it's your pride whether it is your comfort whether it is your image whether it is the element of rejection or mockery that you will get there's a, an old saying that i like to quote every now and then it says if your faith does not cost you anything then it's probably not worth anything and you're probably not doing something right if your faith does not cost you anything, then it's probably not worth anything. Now, so in this verse that we began with, this man makes this statement to Jesus saying that he would follow Jesus anywhere. And Jesus responds with an interesting comment. Follow along as I continue to build this. Verse 58. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, I believe that this reference had more to do with wanting this man to understand what you have to be willing, that you have to be willing to place it all on the line. And, and, and there's a scripture that Jesus said also where he said, no one, no one walks away from land or family or property or brothers or sisters or for the sake of the kingdom of God and that it will not be restored in this time, this lifetime and in the life to come a hundredfold. So there's a sacrificial nature of it and, and, and deals with sacrifice and walk of faith and probably much like the rich young ruler that's in Matthew chapter 19 and it's also in Luke and Mark um, that comfort was too important to some people and that is why Jesus mentioned it because he knew their heart. He knew that they needed to understand the sacrificial element of the gospel. Now let me remind you that we're in the United States of America and there this week we saw... Um, hundreds of Christians being martyred in other countries for their faith, churches being burned down, some in, even in the United States, but in, in other parts of the world. And while we sit here talking about the need to replace an air conditioning system, and so we have a, a level of comfort and here, but they understand that Jesus was talking about other things. Then someone else came and made the same statement after this man did uh, to Jesus saying to him, follow me. Now he, understand this. When Jesus first called his disciples, if you go read through the beginning of the Gospels, um, Jesus said, follow me. And it says that they were fishermen and that they dropped their nets and they immediately walked away from everything. They walked away from their way of life. They walked away from their, their, their nets, all of that stuff, and they immediately followed him. Now, as I go forward today, you need to understand something. There are some of you in this room that God will call you to full-time ministry one day. 
whether it as a pastor or a, uh, an evangelist or a, as a, a missionary or whatever the case. But he, you need to understand something. All of us, all of us are called to the ministry, though. Maybe not vocational ministry, but we're all called to the ministry. We're all called, number one, first and foremost, to be followers of Jesus Christ. So when he says, follow me, this applies to us all. But then he, there's also times when we're all called to follow him in the sense that we're called to ministry to be a soul winner. Every one of us is called to win other people to Christ. All of us are called to be soul winners. But then there's also the element of vocational ministry. Uh, like I, I'm a pastor or there's different people that are called to be missionaries or whatever. And so you have to understand what of those he's talking about. And yet he's talking to all of us. This time when he, uh, uh, there was an answer that was given, which would likely have been a very common answer, especially in the culture of Jesus' days right here in verse 59. Look at this. So to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, this is hard. Let the dead bury the dead. Now, I said it the way a different version says it. It says, let the dead bury the dead. But as for you, go proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, that is a statement right there. That most people cannot handle because what in the world was Jesus saying? They're going to go bury their parents and you said let the dead bury the dead? Jesus, how could you say something like that? And in, like in John chapter 6, people hear something like that and they walk away. Now what this man said would be something that would cause people to say, what a quality young man. He was wanting to go take care of his, of his parents. And in that culture, that would be the norm. And there would all, almost be uh, an expectation that this person would say this for those that knew his father was likely near the end. And to be clear, what this man said did not mean that his father was literally, like we think of in our culture, you know, literally at the doorstep of death, maybe on hospice, not literally at death like that. But rather, in this culture, they did not have assisted living. Uh, and they typically focus on making sure that their parents... Um, uh, had uh, uh, everything taken care of in their last days and it's almost like life stood still for a number of years uh, so when he says let me uh, bury my father and mother he wasn't saying that his parents were, were, were dying he was saying they're in their last years and so it could be, uh, it could be a decade it could be it's the last season of their life but Jesus made a statement that sounded so harsh and so extreme and the reason why it sounded that way is because it actually was harsh and extreme. If, only if somebody was looking at things from an earthly perspective. Can I tell you the biggest challenge to Jesus' hard sayings always, always were this. They were always hard for people that only looked at things from this earthly perspective. That this is all there is. But somebody who looked at things from an eternal perspective... They never struggle with Jesus' hard sayings. Let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. What? What Jesus was saying was let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. You follow me. In other words, the, the, what is going to happen in this life is going to happen. People are going to pass on from this life. But let me tell you something. Let the dead bury the dead, but you follow me because there's people's souls that are at stake. You let other people take care of that, but you need to be focused on the ones that are going to be spiritually dead if you don't respond to the call. Ah. Big picture. Only short-sighted people get offended at this. Because big picture people understand what is at stake. You need to understand uh, this about being a follower of Christ. Jesus does not desire that you, uh, to, for you to allow him to just be a part of your life. He expects you to allow him to be the center of everything. In other words, he, everything orbits around him at the center. He is the lordship of everything in your life. And so Jesus finishes these statements here by referencing something that everyone listened to would have recognized. Look at verse 61. Yet another one said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those in my house. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back 
is fit for the kingdom of God. The plow represents the call to do what Jesus has called us to do. Our calling in ministry. Our calling to serve Jesus. No one puts their hand to the plow and then looks back at their old life. It's worthy to do what Jesus has called us to do. And he was making a statement that pointed back to a statement that was made hundreds of years before this moment. Back to the transition between two of the Old Testament prophets, Elijah and Elisha. I'll show you. Elijah in this moment in time had been a... A prophet for the nation of Israel for quite some time. And there came a time when the Lord made something very clear to Elijah. Elijah had been through a real tough time as the prophet of the nation of Israel. God spoke him into the people. And it was time to pass on his prophetic ministry down to another individual. Another man by the name of Elisha. Not Elijah, but Elisha. And so in that transition, there are some interesting things that are said and done that I will need to explain, but let's read it first. Right here, turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 if you're using our Bible. And I'm going to read this slowly because in just a few verses, so much is said and so powerful. First Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 19. It's ta- Elijah is still the prophet. Now, let me go ahead and say this, because I'm going to get confused, and I'm going to say it wrong. I promise you, I usually do. Elijah was handing off his ministry to Elisha. Do you know how you remember that? If I say it wrong, J comes before S. Elijah came before Elisha. If I say it wrong, you'll, you'll forgive me. Um, verse 19, it says, So he, being Elijah, departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him and he was with the 12th now let me explain this let me say this very clearly so you get this image in your mind a yoke of oxen was a two oxen and they were connected together with these giant wooden uh double rings and so they they would put two oxen together and they would pull a plow and there would be somebody riding on a plow and they would plow fields that way. So there are 12 yoke of oxen, which means that there are 24 oxen with 12 riders on them all. Elisha happened to be on the 12th one. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and he ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. This is what Jesus is referencing when he said this. Verse 21. I'm sorry, in the rest of that. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? Verse 21. And he returned from following him, and he took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them, and boiled their flesh with the yokes of oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Now, during these days, as you have often heard me mention, people in this culture were often identified by the clothing that they would wear. And and if you understand what I'm going to explain to you right now, and I've explained it many times, but if you understand this, so many details in the Bible will make sense to you. Um, For example, the primary clothing during this day was a base garment. uh, I call it a gown. Uh, but it was a base garment that was typically like a beige colored. It was called an ephod in scripture and different things like that. Um, almost everyone wore these. Uh, most people uh, wore them with an outer garment on them, uh, a cloak or whatever. And let me explain this so you get this image in your mind. This base colored gown, this beige colored gown typically, uh, if you look at servants, servants only wore that base colored gown. The reason why they would have an outer garment or a cloak or or a mantle or whatever it was called, it showed people in society somebody's status. And I'm going to give you some examples because it's going to make this make sense and anything else you read in Scripture. It was more decorative. Servants were not allowed to have the outer garment because they had no status in society. And so they would wear an outer garment. It told people whether people were wealthy. It told them what their status was. It often told people what their job was. A prophet could be traveling to a town and no one have ever seen his face, but by his outer garment, they would know that he was a prophet. 
When Jesus walked into towns, they didn't have uh, social media where they could see his picture. And he would walk in town, and he would have an outer garment, and people would walk up to him who had never seen him before and say, Rabbi, Rabbi. How did they know? Because the rabbis wore a certain outer garment. If you go back and read the story, when David danced before the Lord, the old versions of the Bible say that David danced naked before the Lord. It wasn't naked before the Lord. He was just a king who had taken off his kingly outer garment and just wore the role of a servant. And so he was dancing in his base garment. Jesus, in John chapter 13, when he had the last supper with his disciples, it says that he got it from supper and took off his outer garments. And he took on the role of a servant and washed the feet of the disciples. And so um, in this passage of scripture, Elisha is plowing a field. And Elijah walks up to him and takes off his cloak, his mantle, his outer garment, and he, um, which told society uh, that he was a prophet, and it says that he took that outer garment and he threw it onto Elisha. Um, the significance of this fact was that the office of the prophet was about to transition, and the Lord had made it clear who Elijah was going to hand his uh, ministry down to. Now, let me briefly mention something that I will come back to and explain more in depth in just a moment. When Elijah threw his cloak onto Elisha, Elisha immediately knew what it meant culturally, and so he did not even ask for an explanation, but he did make a statement. He said, let me go back and kiss my mother and my father. Elijah immediately responds to Elisha by saying, go back, for what have I done to you? Je Jesus basically made the exact same statement. In other words, com consider the weight of what has just happened to you. Consider the weight of the calling you have just received. In other words, he was saying, go ahead, go see your family, but be aware of what you allow the power of your earthly affections to do to you. Elijah had just given Elisha the high calling of the prophetic ministry and the ministry of the office of the prophet. Now let me stop and explain what I mean when I say the office of the prophet for those that are less familiar with that. Uh, during the Old Testament times and even today, there are many people that can prophesy, but there is the office of the prophet. It is a recognized leadership role. Uh, just the same like in, in a church, there are many people that come up here and preach really good, but I, ha I carry the office of the pastor. Um, there is a, a different, there's an, a mantle that comes with that. Um, basically, Elijah was saying to Elisha, do not allow anything on this earth and affections or relationships to hinder you from doing all that God has called you to do. Um, I, one thing that I love as a pastor is I love the element of mentorship. I love mentoring others and other pastors even and telling them about the things to be careful about, things that I've learned through experience. And that is what Elisha is doing with, I mean, Elijah is doing with Elisha. And Elisha's actions, when, Elisha t when Elijah tells Elisha this, his actions tell us a lot. I want you to watch this. I set all of this up to show you this. Elisha responds with actions that we all need to make note of in our own life. Elisha, obviously, the reason why I pointed out all the different yokes and all of that, Elisha was a very, very wealthy man. I'm going to show you why I say that. You know, when Jesus was approached by the rich young ruler, Matthew chapter 19, in the book of Mark and the book of Luke also, if you go and read those, those there was a young man who, who came up to Jesus and had this dialogue with Jesus. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus pointed out some things to him. And the young man said, hey, I got all that figured out, which he didn't. But he said, I got all those things right. And Jesus perceived what, what was really in his heart. And Jesus said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. Now, Jesus was not at all saying to all of us, that it's anything wrong with being wealthy. I, I think that wealth can oftentimes show God's blessing on somebody's life. Um, he wasn't saying that, that it was wrong to be wealthy. He was saying for that man, that young man, that was, in, that was his earthly affection that was getting in the way of him following Jesus fully. And so if, if this man, that young man, when Jesus said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and follow me, the young man walked away. It was a hard saying that he could not accept. We know that uh, when he went back to say goodbye to his parents, 
who may have been in their older years that they were not, maybe they were not in good health. We don't totally know that. But remember that the lifespan in this culture was shorter than it is in our day. And most of the time when parents were getting closer and closer to death, the child would stay around and care for them through the very last moments. It was honorable. It was noble. It was culturally accepted norm. Most people would live in one city and die in the same city. They never traveled, never business life never carried them to other places. But Elisha made a huge statement by how he uh, uh, handled the wisdom that Elijah just shared with him. And it says that he went back and he did a few notable things. Watch this. It says that he basically, if you get this image, there were 12 yoke of oxen, 24 oxen, uh, which was a significant amount in that days. Because if I have a small one family field, I don't even need a team of oxen. I can do that by hand. But if I have a, a yoke of oxen, I have a pretty good sized piece of property to farm. But if I have 12 yoke of oxen, not only do I have a, a huge amount of, I have the huge uh, expense of the cattle, I have a ex huge expense, that means I have enough property that needs 12 teams of oxen, and I also have the wealth to pay for 11 servants to operate those oxen. So Elisha was a very, very wealthy man, if you look at this culturally. But it says that he went back and he dropped the plowing equipment. He got the plowing equipment, dismantled all of these wooden yokes, and, it's, and he made a fire out of the yokes. A big wooden fire out of these wooden yokes. And it says that he slaughtered the oxen and sacrificed them to God, cooked them on the fire that he had made with the, the yokes, and he threw a goodbye party to everybody, a going away party for himself, fed everybody, kissed his mom and dad goodbye forever, and he took off to follow Elijah. He was very, very wealthy. Now let me make sure that it's clear what is happening here and what was not happening here. He was making sure, once again, this was not a situation where he had to walk away from wealth to follow uh, uh, Elijah. That was not at all the case, to walk in his calling. But what he was making sure of is his specific calling required him to be able to walk away from anything that he had to come back to. There was no open doors. There was no safety net. There was no backup plan. He was all in with God. He was all in with the calling upon his life. He was leaving behind his family. And you need to understand this, that during those days, he was going to travel all around. And his parents in those days, they, he couldn't just get a text message or couldn't FaceTime mom and dad. Um, he, he might have heard weeks after they passed away. And so he was saying his goodbyes now. Jesus was not saying, let me clarify what Jesus was not saying. Jesus was not saying that leave any earthly affections or relationships that might get in your way of you following me. I'm talking about your spouse. Somebody cannot use this as, a, as an excuse to walk away from a marriage. Oh, well, I'm called to the ministry, so I'm going to leave behind. That is not the case. That would, that, would, that, would, uh, that would contradict every other thing in Scripture. That is not the case. So when Jesus was being told by people that they wanted to follow him, he was making some statements that people recognized as a conversation similar to Elijah and Elisha. And he was basically telling them and telling us some things that are very important for us to understand. Not only for those that are called to the ministry, but for every one of us because we are all called to be his followers and we're all called to a ministry. This mission is too important to get hung up with earthly affections and desires that are not helping you in that call. It is an urgent call. Notice the disciples dropped their nets. Elisha burned everything. There is too much at stake. There is eternal matters at stake. And if you wait, then something will give you a reason. If God is calling you to walk away from a relationship, if God is calling you to walk away from something else, if you wait, you won't walk away. If you wait, you won't walk away. Relationships can hinder your commitment and your focus, and everything, everything is secondary to this calling to be his follower. But also, even those that have not felt a calling to an office of ministry, you all have a calling to follow Jesus and to tell others. And therefore, any relationship, any habit, any hobby, 
or anything else, a career, whatever, that is getting in the way of us focusing on being a commitment as a follower of Jesus Christ, we must be willing to lay that thing down on the altar of sacrifice and be willing to burn it up and surrender to the Lord if necessary, but make sure that we're not leaving any doors open because any door that we leave open, our affections will draw us back to. So when Jesus responded to the person who said that they wanted to go and bury their father, the man was not saying that his father and mother had just passed passed away, but rather he was saying that there were other priorities existed that would be an excuse for him, and Jesus was continually calling people to follow him. Some people took that seriously, while others did not. Today, Jesus is still calling people to follow him. Jesus is still calling people to walk away from whatever they've got to walk away from to make him number one in their life. He's still calling people to walk away from anything to go where he's called them to go. If Jesus is calling you to a full-time ministry, then if you know that he's called you to do something and called you in the right timing, you need to make sure that you're willing to do whatever it takes. I, I, don't, I don't say something that light, like that lightly. I, I know that there are family members of mine who, who did not like it when I moved to New Mexico to pastor this church. But the fact of the matter is, is the calling came first. The calling came first, and I, and I lean on that scripture, and I remind myself of that scripture all the time because my parents are getting older now too. And I remember that I, I walked away, and I, and I remember that scripture. No one walks away from lands or properties or families or finances or anything like that for the kingdom of God who will not be restored in this lifetime and in the life to come for the sake of the gospel. Let me tell you something. God has called us to do whatever we've got to do to make him first in our lives. Do whatever we've got to do to make him first in our lives. And if there's something in our life that is calling us to, to teeter back and forth, then we've got to be willing to tear it apart, burn it up, and sacrifice it to him. Because he has called us to make him not a part of our life, but the center of our lives. I'm going to ask everybody to bow your head and close your eyes.